It's a pretty small one, uh, a small naso uh, pharyngeal airway. But this is uh, this would be measured the uh, flange of the NPA, and then again down to the earlobe. So patient's head would be extended, and you'd come in straight down. And then this is cool, you'll actually, there's a, a guy in Bakersfield who connects, will take an ET tube connector, stick it in the trumpet, and then connect the circuit and ventilate his patients that way. He just closes the mouth and then ventilates that way. Which I've done in a pinch, it works. All right, so <clears throat> we're not gonna do the whole SAM tide and induction and intubation right now, I'm just gonna show you the steps of uh, ventilation and intubation. So ventilating. So we'll say we've already done our induction process and our patient's eyes are taped. All right, so my machine is on. We've got high flows of gas. So when we were pre-oxygenating, you know, the circulator is holding a nice firm seal here, the APL was wide open, okay, after induction, um, and then you've pushed your paralytic, um, now it's time for us to manage the airway. So you would tap, you know, Mr. Smith, are you awake? No, check the eye reflex, you would tape. Now comes the mass ventilation. So my CE hold, I'm gonna close the APL somewhere between 15 and 20 in my high flow. And then it's just squeezing the top of the bag. If you can mass ventilate, all is well with the world. Nothing else matters. Even if you have a time, difficult time intubating, as long as you can ventilate, everything is fine. Okay? So now say patient is a dentalist, has sleep apnea. I can't ventilate. There's two ways that I could put an OPA in. So we already decided this is our proper sized OPA. Um, many people, you can put the OPA in backwards. So you start backwards and then you flip 180 degrees halfway through and place it. So now the flange should be above the lips here. You don't want your flange on the lips, underneath the lips. This is how you cause damage to somebody's lips fat lips. So that's how the plan should be. So that's one way you could put it in. The way that I like to do it is by using a tongue blade. Um, when you twist it, sometimes these can be very, um, have like a hard little plastic piece where the tip, where the two pieces of plastic come together to form the product. Um, and you can actually scratch somebody's uh, palate with it. So I don't like to flip it. I like to put a tongue blade in and then you just like that. So you just displace the tongue and just slide it right in. Super simple. And then you can go back to ventilating. All right. Now with intubation, I know it's very hard to get what I'm doing when you guys are so far away and you can't see what I'm seeing in the mouth. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of articulate what I'm seeing and what I'm doing as I go along, but feel free to just shout out questions, okay? So, as I'm ventilating, after I've done my induction, I bring my equipment over. Um, would somebody be my assistant for the intubation? Not a whole lot of volunteers today. <laughs> so um, you'll always be on this side. That's where your circulator will be. So when I ask to pass the, uh, for you to pass me the tube, if you could hand it to me like this. So positioning is really important. Like with everything in anesthesia, positioning is really important. So when you're doing a direct laryngoscopy, ideally you want the patient's head right in about your xiphoid process. If you're doing a video laryngoscopy, you want them closer down to your belly button. Um, this angle will give you, so when they're at the xiphoid, this gives you the best view to line up all of those axes um, to get your best shot at the cords. Beep, beep, beep. 
So when I go to do my uh, intubation, after I've done my mass ventilation, um, start off with a scissor. So middle finger and your thumb. Your thumb is gonna go on the mandible, your middle finger on the upper jawline, and you're gonna push the mandible down with your thumb. Okay, so you're opening up the space for your blade to go in. Um, start slightly on the right side of the tongue. You're gonna walk your blade down. So I'm just right now seeing the hard palate. Now I see the soft palate and I'm gonna start to lift. So I can see the epiglottis. Now I'm gonna lift. And I see chords. So notice I am not cranking back at all. When you're doing your intubation, um, you wanna sweep this top lip here so that you're not pinching the lip between your blade and the teeth. Having a fat upper lip is a very common you know, outcome from novice uh, laryngoscopists. So it's very easy to forget to sweep that top lip out of the way. So when you do your scissor, you know, sweep that top lip, scissor, Bring your blade in very slowly. Hard palate, soft palate. I see the epiglottis. Now I'm gonna bring, I'm using a Miller blade now, so I'm gonna go underneath the epiglottis and lift, and I see the cords. Um, can you pass me the tube? So when I get my view of the cords, you do not take your eyes off of the cords because your hand will follow your eyes. So I'm sliding the tube through, and the balloon is past the uh, vocal cords. Can you pull the stylet for me, please? Perfect. Thank you. So now I'm looking, I'm at about 20 at the teeth. I'm adding some air to my balloon. So not too much, not too little. The, text, the test answer is you use a manometer and it should be less than 20. The real life answer is it's not too tight, it's not too soft. When you connect your circuit, you grab your ET tube, pinch it with your fingers, you hold it at the lip, and you connect your circuit. Rest it there so you don't have the weight of the circuit pulling on the patient's trachea. And then again, you're gonna just squeeze. So I'm looking for now chest rise, fogging in the tube, and then I'm gonna turn and look at my end tidal CO2 monitor and confirm that I have continuous uh, CO2 when I come back, or when uh, repeated CO2. The reason I say that is because if you accidentally insufflate the stomach when you are doing your mass ventilation and you accidentally esophageally intubate, the first two breaths, you may get little blips of CO2 because you insufflated the stomach. So you want to squeeze the bag at least five or six times so that you have confirmation that you have continuous CO2 feedback. Questions?